Hi, I'm Reverend Rich McCain, and I'm here with my baby, my girl, my boo, Arthur Brenda McCain, and we're the host for the Let's Stay Together show. That's right, baby. We are so grateful to Marcus Jones for allowing us to be the guest host of Everyone Has a Story. Tonight's topic is Young, Gifted, and Black, Rise Up and Walk. And we have a great panel of guests tonight, yes, we do. starting with Mr. Andre Williams, the lovely Mrs. Leslie Holly, the dapper Mr. Shelton <laughs> Smith, and the beautiful Mrs. Kelly Fair. Hey, well, welcome to the show. And so what we're basically trying to do today is we're trying to talk about young, gifted, and black uh, African Americans. There's so many negative things that you hear about people in African American descent on the news. We wanted to show a positive thing. So Sheldon, I wanted you to tell me just a little bit about what you do and how you're helping with that cause. Sure, Reverend Rick. I'm Brother Sheldon from Chicago, professional youth mentor. Been mentoring since 1997 for approximately 18 years. Started with Big Brothers, Big Sisters mm -hmm. of uh, Chicago Metropolitan Chicago okay. um, launched my fraternity's national initiative program here in Chicago, partnering with some nearby high schools and um, getting young people on the track, keeping them focused, um, exercising and executing from four programmatic components, introducing them to service for humanity, academics, higher education, which leads to a quality life hey, that well, empowers man, them. Where were you at when I needed somebody like that? Because <laughs> I, I mean, I'm listening to you and I'm like, what is he talking about? But it's wonderful to see that you're actually working with young men and helping them out. We've got a newbie over here, <laughs> Kelly on here. <laughs> Kelly, tell welcome. us a little bit about, about what you do. Yeah, welcome to the McCain yeah. trade. Tell us a little bit about what you do in helping with uh, young ladies. Well, thank you guys for having me. So I am the founder and executive director of Polished Pebbles Girls Mentoring Program. And at Polished Pebbles, we focus on girls being great communicators. We want them to be great communicators at home, school, and a future workplace. So in the last five years, we've worked with about a thousand seven through 17 year old girls through a Saturday program in the mix of after school and during the school day programs. We work with girls in University of Chicago charter schools, Chicago public schools, and several different CHA communities. Okay. We figure what better campus to provide them the opportunity to work on their communication skills, but by partnering with local Chicagoland businesses like Bloomingdale's, Nordstrom's, and Blue Cross Blue Shield. Girls go there, get mentored by the employees, and also do job shadowing and hands-on employment projects. Wow, that's now that's great. impressive. What's the age group again? Seven through seventeen-year-olds. Okay, then mm -hmm. I'm too old. Okay, <laughs> you can come in. Just a little baby. Just, Just a little. little. <laughs> okay. Hey, Andre, tell us a little bit about what you do as well. Well, I'm a ordained minister. I uh, own Millennium Service and CEO of Millennium Service Inc. I also own. This consists of three different companies that I own, which is a graphic design company, hospitality service, and a cleaning service. And what I do is I open doors for people to step out of their negativity into something positive by basically leading by example, mm -hmm. showing, showing the, young, the youth of America all over that we can make a difference in our lives. And we've got one of the young ladies here. I've given you so many titles, Leslie's. I don't even remember what they are <laughs> by now. We're on our show. We have our radio internet show. But tell us a little bit about you. Sure. I'm a licensed clinical professional counselor. Um, and I practice at an agency called Urban Balance, where we have o o over six office locations, roughly six, uh, 60 psychotherapists. I work out of the Chicago and Ravenswood locations. Um, I work with clients that are suffering from depression and anxiety. I also work with adolescents. Um, I see a lot of African American families and guardians and also work with their um, African American youth and just helping them um, set long-term, short-term goals um, and provide resources. Amen. Hey, baby, you got some questions over there for our, our guests, so let's get to those questions. Okay, well, we're gonna leave with, which someone has just said, um, what are you doing to empower our youth to become successful in society? Now, I know, Kelly, you hit on it, but you could hit on it again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you could <can laughs> well, break that down. Well, we figure with a focus on communication skills, communication is in every area of life. So a lot of times we think of it and we tell girls, you know, hey, being able to introduce yourself to someone new for the first time is a new important communication skill. But for a lot of our girls, it's the basic stuff, like you woke up on the wrong side of the bed. Your mom got on your nerves this morning. But it doesn't give you permission to go to school and cuss out your teacher or your principal yeah. because you feel like it. It doesn't give you permission to do that also because you're facing 
high levels of trauma in your community and in your home. So we're trying to equip them with the communication skills to find better ways to express what's going on and kind of deal with that issue first um, and, and then, you know, have more healthy interactions with peers and adults as well. So, Kelly, I'm going to be, you know, most, most of the time we're on the show, I'm like the devil's advocate. That's so I'm going right. to sit there. <laughs> I don't, you know, this is a great program for yeah. me, but as a young lady, I don't see how it fits for me. How can that help me to get to a point where I see the fit? for me, even though I don't see who I am at this point. So the selling point that we have for all of our girls is young to seven up to 17. And we have a lot of students that we work with that are truant. So they are not coming to school, per period. Oh, okay. So the selling point is we say, who wants to work? And in America, we all kind of want to be successful and we've all bought into the idea that some level of employment or business is what is going to make you the money. Kids get that too. And so when we kind of flip it and say, look, if you want to work and you want an after school job, you want a summer job, you want to eventually get there, communication skills are your way to success. And so it kind of helps them get the buy-in and we're preparing them for their first day of work. Back in the 80s, they used to have take your daughters to work day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That stopped. And the reality is a lot of our girls don't necessarily have a parent that is capable of taking them to work to kind of see and expose them to careers. Okay. So that whole getting ready for work thing for a lot of our kids, even if they're seven or the girls that don't come to school, that's that buying in point that says, all right, let me give this communication thing a try. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, Sheldon, uh, you know, for young men who are out there that are trying to seek uh, a better life, but society is basically always showing them a negative light. How do you help them see a positive side of who they are? Branding and imaging. I think that everyone has to first con come to understand that they are a brand. When you go out and you buy Sean John, when you buy Versace, when you buy Gucci, you're buying somebody's brand. It's a brand name. That's someone's name. Your name is a brand and you make that work for you. Through academic achievement and scholastic achievement and those accomplishments, our young people are setting themselves up for success. Everybody doesn't learn the same in an educational and an academic environment, but everybody will have a brand. Right. Whether you go to a four-year university such as Morehouse, such as Yale, such as Harvard, or whether you go to a vocational school and take up a trade, there's something out there for you. And once you are receptive to going out and you're courageous enough to go out and conquer what's in store for you, then your brand becomes that image that you want to be recognized for. It's just like, you know, a lot of African Americans, uh, males predominantly, are profiled. If they wear a hoodie, if they have sagging pants on, if they have Timberlands on, these young guys are profiled. If they wear white tees, if they wear wife beaters. Just because you see a young boy or a young man of color, it doesn't mean that he's a threat to society. That could just be his down day. I can go to work. I work in a, a white collar environment. And I go to work every day. I work with stockbrokers on a day to day basis. And so I have seen some of the wealthiest come across my feet. But when I'm at home, if I'm in the Roseland community in which I grew up, if I have on a Bears baseball cap, a Bulls throwback, and I'm outside in my Rockaway jeans and my boots, I'm just casual. And that's okay. Yeah. It's not for you to say what's going in the, on with the inner me. But that happens a lot of times because of what happens is with that branding, there's a positive branding, there's a negative branding. So I'm going to switch it over to Leslie. What happens when we have such of a negative uh, branding about who we are, and even though we're trying to walk positive, we get so many things against negative about us. How do we reverse that switch or that thought process of people because of what they see already, the vision of who we are, and they don't know who we are. Yeah, I think it's important to note that we've got some, I mean, you guys have some lovely guests here talking about all the things that they're doing, contributing and helping the youth. Um, it's important to note, it only takes one person, research shows, it only takes one person to work with a child, to um, take that time to mentor a child, um, to influence that child, to create change mm -hmm. for that person, for that child. It only takes one person. Yeah, and I like um, that. It only takes one person. And I guess for most of the people out there that are listening, that you have to understand that it, you, don't need a, you don't need a village. 
that one individual can make a big a difference huge in difference. someone's life. But what about the girl that's not in school? The girl that we see on the streets and we know she's not in school and her branding does look kind of suspect. Mm -hmm. Well, I think for that young lady that is not finding herself because of experience, because of her self-esteem, because of whatever it is, I think that once she is embraced by love, once someone takes an authentic interest in her, then she will come to learn what her qualities are. She'll learn that she too is pregnant with possibility. I call that being pregnant with possibility. Like and a lot of people are afraid to birth their potential. Yeah. It's lying within. And that one person that Leslie was just speaking about, it has to be willing to work with that person and pull it out. Now, it may not come out tomorrow. But you're going to have to grind with them. You're going to have to get in the trenches with them. Mm -hmm. You know, when she's at her ugliest, when she's at her worst, you know, when she's abusive to herself, yeah. mm -hmm. then you're going to have to be that resource for her. You're going to have to intercede for her. You're going to have to pray for her. And you're going to have to help her get to the next level. Yeah. Hey, uh, we're going to come right back with uh, Andre is going to be talking about some things. But, baby, what's the commercial we're going to? We're going into the lovely Nina Simone young gifted and black song so enjoy the beautiful lyrics and learn a thing or two we'll be right back after these breaks <laughs> You had to know all the words, which was frightening. Rick, you know the lyrics. I couldn't sing. I don't know the lyrics anymore now. <laughs> but at Give me your best could, John Legend I, I right could, now. John Legend. I, I got to think about John Legend. song. Just sing, baby. You know, Just but sing. It, 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 this is not my audition time so right now. But we're going to go back to Kelly, because you were saying something about what uh, Sheldon has said. So add on to that. No, I, th I thought Sheldon was making a great point about there's young women out here, and we look at the exterior. But he makes a great point that she is pregnant with possibilities. Mm -hmm. But we're looking at the exterior for a, a variety of reasons. And we've created within our community also biases. Yeah. So we look at her and say, mm, look at that girl. Look how she dressed. Oh, she got a nasty attitude. We get caught up with so much of what we're seeing on TV and the media and the representation of young black girls and young black women. So I think we have to really, when we're talking about our young people, is have a real conversation about what kind of barriers and masks and kind of perceptions and judgments do we need to peel off as the adults in that's our community? Good. Yeah, that's true. So, you know, I can't keep looking at her as this negative thing and then talk about what she should be doing. So it, it's an opportunity where we really have to talk about recruitment of African-American adults as mentors in our community, whether it be in organized programs, whether it be encouraging them to do it individually. But regardless, whatever the recruitment has to involve training. Yeah. Because there's different sectors and people in our community who still live in Roseland, like I do, and then those who don't. And so they don't know why she's doing what she's doing, yeah. why she's wearing what she's wearing, why she's saying. And so we have to make sure that we're educating folks. Which so is basically really almost do. like an, uh, an interpersonal profiling each other. We're yeah. already looking at the individual saying something negative because mm -hmm. of what we perceive before we even get a chance to have the person speak to us and find out who they are. Absolutely. That's true. Maybe well, you got someone to say? Yeah. Um, like you said, we are perceiving so many things on people. Like, I'm a product of Roseland as well. Mm -hmm. And great fruit come out of Roseland <laughs> and Inglewood, <laughs> but we do Dead tagline. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we know it comes out of that area. But we tagline it because it's, oh, that's Inglewood or that's Phoenix or that's Rose and nothing good come out of that. Well, we're a product of those areas, those communities, and we have people who actually worked with us. And you shocked me because I, I do remember back in the 80s, it was parents taking their children mm -hmm. to school. I didn't yeah. know that stopped. And that's kind of sad because a lot of things to stop with the educational program messed up so many things for our youth. And that leads me up to my next question. How can that change a little bit? Because, I mean, they cut out so many things. I'm not downing the system, but we don't have the, the, the Sheldon out there to help the young men over here and the young ladies. We don't have Kelly. We don't have Andre with his backstory to go, you know, every day and help young people. What can we do in the education system or suggest to them? 
that you need to beef this up. We need to bring this back into the curriculum. You know, I think there is a, um, a huge divide, unfortunately, um, between the school system and the communities, mm -hmm. oftentimes, and that we need to bridge that, um, you know, we need to help bring those communities together, bring the school system and the community at large together. Parents, um, the, the communities, they have to get involved in the schools. Yeah. They have to push for change. They have to join the local school council. They have to go to parent-teacher conferences. They have to find out what programs are in their communities. They have to come together and harness their resources. We have to do that as a community. Yeah. And I think, um, unfortunately, you know, there's, a, there's some great schools in Chicago. There's some horrible schools in Chicago. I think um, it's really up to us um, as a community to come together and really push for some change and use our resources that we already have. And, and, and come together and help each other. Kelly, you want to add I something? I think one of the things that's important too, when we talk about our communities, we're talking about the youth and then we talk about the things that parents need to be doing. I think now from my time and my experience, parents need training. That we're talking about a generation of young people who yeah. have not been loved and nurtured properly, but that's because their parents have not been loved and nurtured properly. So we're expecting something from a generation of parents who, quite frankly, really don't know what that looks like. Yeah. So I think the advocacy definitely has to come from the parents in the community, learning how to advocate, but somebody got to teach them. So one of the things I think is important in the African-American community is you grew up in Roseland, you went to school in the hundreds, don't forget that. Just because you moved out does not mean that that is no longer a part of your community. Yeah. When I do calls and I ask for guest speakers sometimes, and we put some of the programs up in schools that they can go to, I can't get somebody to come to the far southeast side. Yeah. You know, so one time on Facebook I said, wait a minute, <laughs> you grew up in the hundreds. Did you forget that? Yeah. We sat in school next to each other. That's the same community that molded and made you. Mm -hmm. So you have a responsibility to go back and mold and make those kids. Well, what basically what happens in a lot of times is that we, we want to get away from a society mm -hmm. of, of what we think is corrupt of negative. So once we get away from it, we just want to leave ourselves. It's almost like the crab in the barrel. Mm -hmm. We don't want to bring anybody out. We just want to get out. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times when we get out of a situation, we don't want to go back into it. I'm, I was going to say something. Whatever happened to PTA? I don't know if most of y'all right, remember what that was. Right, I was going to bring that up. There was always <laughs> you know. the PTA, the PTO. And I, I think also, um, to kind of speak to what Kelly is saying, I don't know that the importance of family structure is there. Mm -hmm. Because when we were growing up in our generation, our parents were very much aware of everything we did everything. from school <laughs> to where you were in the right. neighborhood which you were involved in in the community day camp all of it and you now had to be back when those lights came exactly on man there. and and so i think now there are you know parents that you know unfortunately parenting doesn't come with instructions yeah and so i'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and say they're doing as best they can but i think that there's a generation if we speak truth to power they came from an era where there was a high rate of drug existence mm -hmm. and implementation primarily into minority communities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not only communities of color, because I'm not going to sit on a panel and say that all black people are led down this, this, this path of destruction. But there was a time where a, we're now looking at a generation that evolved from that. And so when you have the, you know, the mother is, is, is 40 or the grandmother uh, you know the grandmother's much younger now than the mama and the grandmama are still trying to get out right. on saturday night mm -hmm. good yeah. point i have to stop you right there tell a quick scenario <laughs> walgreens the other day young girl about 15 years old beautiful young girl i had seen a little brother with her i thought was her little brother i said oh this little boy is so cute this your little brother and she said no it's my son and i'm thinking he's how and when she told me, I'm doing the math, like, you had this baby at 13. Right. So, so you 13, your mother probably exactly. not even 30. So grandparents are not that much older than the child's parent. Mm -hmm. And so they're still at the same place in their lives. Yeah. So they're basically living the same lives. We've all heard that the man dated the mama, now he dating the daughter. Yeah. So, I mean, we have, because you're not that far in age. Mm -hmm. And so you're running in the same path. You're yeah. likely, your paths are gonna cross at some yes. point. And so we don't have 
those fundamental things that we can say that we took for granted mm -hmm. as far as the homework, as far as young people being validated and confirmed in their home. And then it doesn't matter what society thinks yeah. of you. And then I have a question. We talk about looking at the exterior, like Kelly said. Are <laughs> we as guilty as the white police officer that profiled the young man? Because we're mm. looking at an exterior yeah. and we're yeah. making a judgment. We definitely are just about as guilty. We don't want to admit that we're about that. Oh, no. Guilty, but we are because we are just as, you know, racial to each other or profiling each other as anyone else. But I want to go back. I'm, Andre, we're going to have you. Uh, Andre has a story that I want him to tell, so I'm going to have Andre tell it. But I want to go to Leslie for a second. We were just talking about some of our kids are having kids at young age, and then the grandmama might be 30, and the grand, grandmama is 45. That didn't happen back in my day in the 60s or the 70s. I'm trying to figure out what happened where all of a sudden now the stereotypical mother fear or father fear there that used to scare you from even doing anything what had what changed now where that doesn't seem to be a concern anymore kids are having kids at younger ages back then you were afraid to even think about having a child mm -hmm. you know but yeah. you know now it's like it's just common commonplace people where kids are having kids at an earlier age early and earlier well I definitely think you know, to your point, some of the things that we were talking about, about systems being put into place, um, that has really, I, I think, pulled our communities apart, the drugs. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, teenage pregnancy as well is, um, you know, is very prevalent. Um, and I think what we're talking about is lack of resources. Mm -hmm. And when we continue this cycle, um, we, we kind of cut ourselves off um, for, you know, higher education, to gain more resources, to then be able to help our communities. And then when we do get out of the community, like you were saying, we leave. You know, I mean, once we, once we uh, graduate and, you know, maybe we've made it out, we don't come back. And we don't take the resources that we've gotten and bring them back to our communities. Yeah. And so that's, I think, um, something that, that we really need to address, you know, this issue with teenage pregnancy, this issue with, um, you know, fathers not being in the home, uh, no, no co-parenting. Um, many children are grown up today without any kind of father figures in the home. And then once they have children of their own, they don't really understand, you know, right. what a healthy family dynamic looks There's like. There's no value I'm to pass I'm going to have to stop you for a second because we're going to have to go to a commercial break on a second. So I need to go to Andre when we come back. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the show. Uh, everyone has a story. This is the Let's Stay Together show. We'll be right back after these breaks. Welcome back to Everyone Has a Story. We're the host of the Let's Stay Together show. Uh, our guest, one of our guests, uh, Kelly Flair, had to uh, leave us for a short while. So we're going to go on with Andre. So Andre, I want to ask you this question. Tell us a little bit about your story and how you came from an individual who may have been considered negative to now such a positive light. Well, it used to be a time when uh, a lot of people looked up to me, looked up to me in the wrong way because of the things I was doing. Mm -hmm. I used to be heavily hooked up. I sold a lot of drugs. I ended up going to prison. They gave me 60 years, but God said no. So Amen. in the process of me being in prison, I sat down and educated myself. One thing I did, I said, if this is the fruit of my labor, if this is the fruit of my labor, I don't want this. And I walked away from, I had a restaurant, two beauty shop, barber shop, but it all came from a legal means. So people look at me in a different way. So today what I do, well, let me back up. When I was sat down, I read the Bible 16 times mm. because I said, Amen. if this the fruit of my labor, I don't want that kind of money. Right. It's some, it's some better than this when you allow another human being to dictate your pace, right? So I gave 60 years back and God allowed me to come home and the same, principles that I apply to myself being incarcerated in these, in these maximum facility prisons. I use the same motivation today instilling these values into you, the people that have lost, mis, mis, uh, misled, confused. Uh, the, the people that generally are thrown away, right. that society di uh, dictates, well, you're going to be nothing and all this stuff. When we are something, we have a chance. So I take young brothers and sisters and I lead by example. And I show them these things. So People see the things, how I'm being blessed today, and they be like, how do you do that? And so what I do, I, I do uh, 
I just do interaction with people from all over the country. Yeah, and uh, you know, it's a wonderful story that you have. Uh, we're going to share a little bit more about it a little later and how your lifestyle and how you gave everything up for Jesus Christ and to be able to do things. And one of the things about the Let's Stay Together show is to know our glory. We, you have to know our backstory. And so you have a great backstory that we're going to share on the second half. Hey, Tracy, I think we've got some uh, questions from the audience. Yes, and we're real blessed to have so many young people yes, here today. Yes, we are. So um, we have our question here. You want to stand up and tell us who you are? Uh, my, name. my name is Jordan, and I have a question from Mrs. Uh, Shelton. I want to know, in your younger years, what made you want to dedicate your life to uh, helping youth and making them better? That's a great question, Jordan. Thank you for that. Um, when I was a teenager growing up, I wasn't introduced to programs through structured organizations. Um, and one day, God laid it on my heart when I was in my early 30s. Um, God laid it on my heart to give back. I had no biological children. And I was always drawn to youth. I always loved my nephews. I always loved the kids in my community. And so I sought out opportunities in which I could give. I found Big Brothers Big Sisters of Metropolitan Chicago. I found out through them, through that system, that there was a young man in my neighborhood that without that system, I would never have known existed. That young man and I became to bond. He was like a son to me. And he grew up, he was 11 years old when we came to meet, struggling through school. He grew up, went away to Prairie View A&M, he seemed to follow my footsteps just like a son would follow his father's. I became a very active member and I'm a deacon, proud deacon of Trinity United Church of Christ. He became a member of Trinity United Church of Christ. I was in the men's drill team. He was in the youth drill team. I became a man of Phi Beta Sigma. He became a young man of Phi Beta Sigma. So I'm proud to say that all that God laid on me was from God, gifted by God. So it is all of God. Yeah, any other questions Amen. from the audience? Yes, I think we have one uh, last question. Hi, my name is Quentin Hampton, and my question is for Leslie. Was it, did, did you have a lot of trials and tribulations getting to where you are at this point in your life? Well, I think that's a great question. You know, I, um, I'm a product of an environment where, you know, I grew up with a mom and a dad in the home. Um, I... I'm definitely not self-made. I, I definitely give my parents all the credit for where I am today. Um, I didn't want to go to college. I wanted to hang out. Yeah. But I had expectations put on me. And those expectations were that I was going to go to college, that I was going to get, you know, decent enough grades to go to college, that I was going to have a job. I had a job from 15 on. Um, so I had expectations put on me and a lot of discipline put in me, um, a lot of resources poured into me. And so, you know, I can definitely speak to um, the benefits of that, um, that it's important that, you know, we put expectations on our kids. It's important that we realize that someone did help us. Um, everybody doesn't have that, um, but all, all it takes is one person, like yeah. you were talking about. So that's my story. Hey, we thank you very much. Yeah, we thank you all for being the guests on there. We had uh, our judge uh, who wasn't able to make it uh, here because he got, you know, called away. And so we appreciate that. Hey, we hope you've enjoyed Everyone Has a Story. This is the Let's Stay Together show. I'm your host, Reverend Rick McCain, along with my baby, my girl, my boo, Arthur Brendan McCain. We'll be seeing you real soon. Thank you for listening to Everyone Has a Story.